Okay. Looks like we've got everyone in the queue. So good afternoon, everyone. We're uh, really thrilled to have so many folks from around the country joining us today for a really important conversation. Uh, my name is Matt Gandel. I'm president and CEO of Education Strategy Group, which is a mission-driven consulting firm that works with American education business and civic leaders to try to increase educational attainment in order to expand economic mobility in the US. Uh, on behalf of Rob Anderson of the State Higher Education Executive Officers Organization and Noah Brown of the Association of Community College Trustees, I wanna welcome you to today's webinar for a really important conversation about how post-secondary systems and institutions uh, can better serve the needs of adult learners at a really crucial time for our country. Our three organizations worked together uh, last year when the pandemic hit uh, to put a series of webinars together to help um, post-secondary leaders look around the corner and prepare for what the new normal we thought would become. Uh, and wow, did a lot happen in that period of time. Obviously, that, that you all who are leading institutions and systems of higher education have right, been right there in the middle of. Now we're acutely aware as we begin to see the light and we're coming out of the pandemic and institutions are, are reopening, um, that there are still a significant amount of needs um, and that uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, the good news is uh, there are great examples that we can draw from, uh, from folks around the country who have done this work. And there's a pretty big infusion of, of resources, at least from the federal government, that might allow some, um, some new and native, innovative things uh, to be tried. Um, and this, we think this work and this topic is particularly important right now due to all the displaced workers that, we, that are looking to upskill um, with a clear eye toward particular communities, uh, communities of color, uh, low income communities that have been hit hardest by the pandemic, both in terms of health um, and employment. So um, with all these resources flowing now, um, and we know there are some really important gaps to fill, we thought it was important to pick our heads up, learn from others who have tried to innovate, um, and again, look around the corner and think about uh, systemic changes and creative solutions uh, to this problem. So that's what we'll be doing over the next hour, looking at innovative institutional and state policies uh, to better target and support adult learners, those looking to reskill, uh, those enrolling in higher education for the first time, those who didn't complete higher education that might come back in order to build a better future for themselves. All those are on the table. Um, as I said, it's timely because um, of the resources the federal government has put forward. There were two previous installments, as we know, of, of uh, federal stimulus resources last summer and then in December. And then most recently, the American Rescue Plan put a substantial amount of money, um, is putting a substantial amount of money, I should say, into both K-12 and higher education to support recovery. Nearly 40 billion is going into higher education. Half of these funds must be used for financial aid, as I think most of you know. And the federal guidance has made it clear that adult students, including those that are in short-term non-degree programs, are eligible for these financial aid dollars, which is a shift um, based on um, you know, existing rules governing those, uh, those dollars. So there's some leeway and some opportunities here, we think, for uh, post-secondary institutions and systems to creatively use those funds to support adults. Um, and then there's also some leeway in the use of the remaining 50% uh, for wraparound services and other uses that could help uh, with this work as well with these really important learners. So with that said, um, I'm really pleased to be joined today by three outstanding leaders in the field who are doing this work, have been working particularly over this past year in really creative ways to reach uh, adult learners and try to tie economic attainment with, uh, excuse me, educational attainment with economic uh, mobility and opportunity. First off, Carrie Ebersole, who serves as the director of the Office of 60 by 30, a division of the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Uh, dedicated to achieving the state's 60% attainment goal uh, by 2030. Uh, really excited to have Carrie here and to learn about how the state of Michigan has um, advanced this work over the past year. 
Dr. Sue Elsperman is the president of Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana. I've known Sue for years, and I know the great work that Ivy Tech has done uh, within its institution and in partnering with, with the state to have a broader impact um, as well. So I'm eager to hear more about uh, how this work is playing out in Indiana. And then last but not least, Gregory Hale is the president of Broward College in Florida. And I'm particularly impressed with some of the work uh, that Broward has been doing recently to address this very issue in very, very creative ways with a clear eye toward equity. So um, they're gonna be the, the stars of this show and they're gonna um, tell you about what they've learned and we're gonna kind of have a dialogue across the three of them. And then we'll open it up uh, to questions uh, a little later in the conversation. If you wanna ask questions for this particular Zoom, the chat feature will be shut off, but you can use the Q&A feature on the toolbar. If you wanna pose a question, please feel free to do that anytime during the discussion. And um, as we get toward the, the latter half of this conversation, we'll start drawing those questions out and, and posing them to the panelists. We do have over 200 uh, participants from around the country. So if we don't get to all of your questions, please know that we will try to be responsive after the uh, webinar with some follow-up information um, that answers any remaining questions. So with that, let me start with a, a big picture question to the three of you about adult learners in general, that learners over the age of 25 are making up a rapidly growing uh, percentage of higher education enrollment, I think, as we know, um, across the country. And as I said earlier, um, the economic displacement uh, has really hit certain communities hard um, over the past year. And uh, there's even greater need uh, for adults to be able to come back and reskill or upskill. Um, before we get into the specifics of each of your approaches and your strategies in your, in your uh, systems and in your states, um, can you just first explain why you've made it made this a priority? Um, give a little context to why you focused on adult learners in, in your post-secondary strategies. Either any of you, Sue, you want to go first? Sure. Since my, okay. Since I didn't mute myself, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, at Ivy Tech, we know that for the state of Indiana and our employers specific, specifically to have the skilled workforce they need. We have to go beyond the traditional aged 18 to 22 year old going on to post-secondary. We've adopted the 60% goal, 60% of our workforce having a post-secondary degree or credential by 2025. And that requires us to encourage and help uh, many adult learners come back. At Ivy Tech, we are three quarters of our student body are of that kind of profile. And uh, they are working adults many of them uh, experiencing all the trauma of uh, this COVID world we've been in. But we know that we need, yes, we need all of our 18-year-olds to go on, but we certainly need many more adults to pursue a meaningful, high-value uh, credential that leads to a high-wage career. Thank sure, you. I'll jump. Yeah, sorry, I'll just jump in uh, for everyone. Um, you know, I, you know, from our perspective here in Michigan, you know, we this has been a key priority for our governor, Governor Whitmer, in our first state of the state um, address, uh, set out that vision to hit that sixty percent goal by twenty thirty here in the state, and. You know, I think um, President Elsperman um, said that well in terms of, you know, the data shows that post-secondary achievement connects directly to wages, and those jobs are also often more recession-proof or less susceptible to blips and, and challenges that we see through our economy. So it has been a key piece to not only provide folks an avenue to pursue their dreams, um, to fulfill a goal, uh, but also get, as you mentioned, those credentials that are going to lead to those higher paying jobs and a path to prosperity. So it's been key. That has been the context even early on pre-COVID uh, to set forth um, um, this priority. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, and I'll, uh, you know, to somewhat, to some extent, echo it. This is, you know, something that certainly Broward College has been working on for years. And I, I'd like to think that most of our community colleges have been living this uh, existence, uh, even pre-COVID, right? We exist to serve the entirety of our community. 
our average age pre-COVID was 27 years old. Um, this is really not a new population for us, but it is a new challenge, a new way to experience this population because as a result of these last 14 months, we know that uh, as we think about not only this age group, but where they reside and the communities they've come from, there's just been tremendous devastation from education to workforce to healthcare, and you could go on and on. And so um, this has been something that certainly we've been focused on for, for quite some time. I think it's uh, in sharper relief, both for us uh, in our institution, as well as for the business community and others who, um, who touch our work. So um, I won't say it is new, uh, but certainly uh, we are deeply ingrained. And I think the what you're seeing from, um, and I know we'll get into this from the federal government as well as beyond the business community, nonprofit communities, et cetera, watching our capacity to make a difference in this age group uh, in a way that we've known for years, but others are becoming more acquainted with. Thank you, Greg and Sue and Carrie for the Opening salvo. You're at, yes, this was a this was a need before the pandemic, and certainly most community colleges have been working at this. Um, and that I think the pandemic, safe to say, just exacerbated and accelerated the need to really work to creatively address the needs of adults, and and arguably in the four year institutions as well, especially regional institutions, we're seeing this growing need. Um, so let's let's dig in a little deeper to the strategies now that, that you've each been uh, pursuing. Again, maybe we'll start back with you, Sue, at Ivy Tech. Um, give us a sense of of what you've done as part of the over the state's overall rapid recovery plan. I know you launched a program called Taking Hoosiers to the Next Level, which I think provided opportunities for adult learners to come back, uh, get as you say high value credentials. I know you had been doing that before the pandemic as well, but Tell us a little bit about how you've um, maneuvered in this last year and what the response has been um, to it. And you're on, take yourself up, there you go. Yes, thank you. This was a great partnership with the state of Indiana. The governor had stood up a recovery task force uh, last summer and that task force approached Ivy Tech and said, hey, could you help us? We knew there were hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers who had been displaced, and could we help them earn a short-term credential? Now, Indiana already has something called next level jobs, about 100 short-term, 30 credit hour or less credentials that are free community college. Anybody can come back uh, and, and take that from us or other qualified providers. Um, so that gave us a framework to work with. But when they said, can you help these 600,000 Hoosiers it was a bigger challenge. So taking Hoosiers to the next level, the Department of Workforce Development marketed directly to those 600,000 Hoosiers on our behalf, sending them the invitation, letting them know specifically in their email, text, et cetera, marketing directly to say, hey, you can go back. Ivy Tech is on eight weeks. We've gone to an eight week format. So our fall had already begun. We in four weeks stood up uh, 5,000 open slots across our 19 campuses to allow Hoosiers to pursue 20 some credentials, short-term credentials, which the state was going to use their, their CARES Act funding, their federal funding for. So we had to be very purposeful to get this going before the end of the year, because we all knew that at that time, that was a deadline. So we uh, stood up by October uh, we had 600,000 marketed to over 80,000 came to our website and out of that nearly 10,000 Hoosiers applied of which we enrolled 2,700 in short order, less than four weeks. Now for, for Greg and others here who are from higher education, you know that is a real task to try to turn our ships that fast, um, but very proud to say we did it. We've continued to refine that program. so. This spring, we added another nearly a thousand. We're continuing through the summer, but the most exciting part is we're now working with Department of Workforce Development to immediately going forward, we call it taking Hoosiers to the next level 2.0, that it will be an automatic marketing that happens whenever a Hoosier is unemployed, displaced from their current work so that they, they understand these are 
the opportunities I have to go back and skill up for that next career. So we're excited. It was a lot and we graduated um, 800 some this spring out of that program. There's many still going in it. It is changing lives and to have that deep partnership with our state has been incredible. And of course, Ivy Tech's unique. We are a statewide system. So we do have campuses in every community, but it has helped us deliver on the promise. Now, what we know from those next level jobs is that those who come out of those programs are making over $6,800 more on average. We're tracking that wage increase. So when we talk about, carry the work you're trying to do to get uh, your Michiganians, I don't know how to say that, but- <laughs> It's a big call. debate, Sue. It's a big Thanks. debate up here. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, how to get them into that better career. We now know these short-term credentials are doing that and, and they're stackable. So you don't stop there. It's often opening the door for uh, one of our Hoosiers, those adult returning students to continue on to even better careers, to continue growing uh, their prosperity going forward. But we were very pleased with how the program went. We had a lot of learning to do to be, to flex the way we needed to flex, but get helping nearly 4,000 now Hoosiers uh, get into better jobs, better careers, is is very uh, something we're very proud of. Thanks, Sue. Um, appreciate you're also kind of coming back to the idea of high high value credentials. That we know there are a lot of these short, a lot of short term programs, but it sounds like you worked to target yes. uh, the well paying you know well paying high, growth, high demand high wage industries. Yeah. So the next level jobs they're all already high wage, high demand. They've been vetted by the employer community and MZ data, other. So we then took that hundred and said, look, we can't expand all hundred, but we could pick 20 that across our campuses, we could expand availability, add faculty, make sure that we're meeting the needs of particular industries. But yes, it, you're absolutely right. Everything we do now is around high wage, high demand. That has to be our emphasis to get are those adults into better, better, better jobs, better careers? Appreciate that emphasis. I know that's a big debate here in, in, in Washington, D.C. about short-term Pell and um, that not all short-term credentials are created equal in terms of outcomes. So glad that you're emphasizing that. Uh, Greg, let's shift to uh, Broward and hear about your innovative program, uh, maybe others, but certainly Broward Up um, has caught our attention and the attention of others. I know that that stands for unlimited potential, but yeah. um, really important work to target um, communities in need and be creative about how to reach them. So tell us how that's, tell what you've done and how it's gone. No, I, I appreciate that, Matt. So, you know, about uh, almost three years ago now, um, when I stepped into this role, one of the, the first things I asked our team to do at a time, if we can recall it, when the employment rate was just so low, it's low again now, it's getting lower, but at the time in Broward, it was about three, uh, three points. And, uh, and nationally, it was probably around four, slightly under four. And But what I wanted to understand better was how exactly we were performing in pockets of Broward County and in certain zip codes in our community. And so despite that unemployment rate at three points, we knew we were able to, uh, to understand that in certain zip codes, there were unemployment rates of 10, 15 plus percent. And at the same time, I think about our two main source of clientele are students or potential students in the community who are saying they can't find jobs and employers at a time when the labor market was as tight as anyone could remember saying, I can't find talent. And I would challenge those employers to say, well, where are you looking? And for us as a higher edu education institution, we had to ask ourselves, what are we doing to go and get those students? And if I were to show you a map of Broward College's 10 brick and mortar locations, you would see, particularly back in 2018, that we had almost no overlap with the six zip codes that had the highest unemployment rates and lowest post-secondary attainment rates. These were the communities of individuals that didn't have the technology necessarily to take our courses online. They didn't have the transportation necessary. In other words, they might have to take two buses to get to us. And these are the same individuals who probably didn't have the time because they were busy working two jobs and taking care of families and all the other things that come with them. Yet we were calling ourselves accessible, even to these people. So what we decided to do is change our access model. 
what we did was we partnered with organizations like county libraries, like the Urban League, like the Boys and Girls Club, all of which were located in the heart of those most challenged communities. We call them our Broward Up communities, as you mentioned, Matt, those communities with unlimited potential. We needed to bridge the opportunity gap. So we decided to partner with each of these organizations to say, we would like to be in your site, in the heart of this community, providing post-secondary education opportunities so that between someone's home and the bus stop with Broward College. In a matter of two and a half years, we've added 19 locations in the heart of, of the six most challenged zip codes, including 12 cities. And it has been remarkable to see the partnerships that have come forward. Now, what's been also really important is that we've been able to serve 2,600 students in that time, nearly 2,000 which have received certifications and great stories about folks who had lost their jobs and now they're getting paid $50,000 a year as a result of taking a 16 or six week course even for that matter. So what we're seeing is a different kind of potency regarding frankly proximity and now we're seeing that convert into attainment, which we all know, as Kerry mentioned, is the most powerful tool for economic and financial mobility. And that's already translating. And what's key here too, is that we're not stopping at the certification model. Sue talked about this. This is a laddering up opportunity. So I think about the historic model that we've probably all engaged in, where when someone is pursuing their degree, we know that life can interrupt. And what we want them to do is have a certification on their way to pursuing their degree so that if life interrupts, they at least have that certification as a backstop. What we're doing is using the certification very transparently as the on-ramp because we know, especially with adult learners with lives and who need uh, careers, we have to say to them, uh, if you take this amount of time, maybe it's just eight weeks in the certification, we can still upskill you and help you economically. But if you continue, we can do that much more. And if you continue again, did you realize you were halfway to your associate's degree? Let's keep going and you change the conversation. So uh, we've done this in the last two and a half years with great success, but part of it has also been because of the philanthropic and state support. The 2,600 students who have gone through the programs, none of them have paid a single dime. It has been at no cost to them to be able to do this. And the returns that we know are, are the county and the state are reaping are at least tenfold as a result of those contributions. So it's been a great way to change our access model to address the needs of those who need us most with technology, time and transportation challenges. And we look forward to continue to expand upon that work. It's an amazing story and incredible work in a short period of time. So congratulations on that. And I know uh, due to that and other things, you were, a, you were a finalist in the Aspen Prize this, this year. So you've been getting some, some good recognition and um, doing some of the hardest work I've heard of in terms of reaching those communities and being creative about the partners you're working through and with. So we'll come back to some of that in a, in a few minutes. So appreciate that. Let's turn to um, the great state of Michigan where the Michiganders live. Um, I don't know if that's the right way. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Okay. That's well, the debate. Um, <laughs> the debate going. Sue and I will debate. Um, so tell us, so Carrie, I know you've used, um, in part, you used CARES Act funds last year to kind of launch pretty quickly a, um, a strategy around Re Michigan Reconnect, front futures for frontliners, um, all of which were designed to sort of do what we're hearing about at the institutional level. Um, in Broward and in, in uh, Ivy Tech at a state level and reaching those adult learners um, who need to upskill or reskill. Tell us how that's gone. Tell us a little bit more about it, how it's gone in terms of uptake rate and uh, where you think you're going next. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think we all feel uh, what we've been through over the last year, right? Our families, our communities, government institutions and beyond, it's been hard. Um, and it's, but there's been this um, uptake of, or increase of federal funds coming into the state. And with that comes great opportunity. Um, and especially with the American Rescue Plan, we have once in a generation opportunity to impact um, our states and communities. Um, so it's, it is um, a breath of fresh air, if you will, uh, to look at what opportunities we can provide. So last year, uh, when the CARES Act and the, the GEAR funds within the CARES Act um, 
uh, came through was passed in July in Congress. Um, we wanted to launch the ReConnect program very closely modeled after the Tennessee program. Again, for all the reasons we've already talked about, we know that there are folks that want to go back to school or to school to get those credentials, but they may not have the funds to get them there. Um, and we wanted to help that tuition support. Recognizing where we were in the, the pandemic at that point in time and um, what we were able to purpose those gear dollars within the CARES Act, um, the governor said, we got to launch a program for our frontliners. Those folks that are serving are in key essential industries that didn't have the choice to stay at home. They had to be out there making sure we had groceries on our table and um, you know, safeguarding our streets and beyond. So we wanted to offer um, an opportunity, a tuition free path to community college or to a, a certificate in a high demand um, area. Um, and we were able to do that. We launched that in September. The governor was able to act alone. Um, so we were able to move forward, the, uh, forward this with, through some executive authority there. We launched the program in September, meaning applications went live online. And by December 31st, we had um, 120,000 applications. And um, I think what's central to this story is some of the stories that came in from the applicants, you know, from, you know, I wanted to be a role model for my kids. Um, I didn't have the funds to meet tuition, um, but I know I need this certificate to be able to uh, apply for this job. And um, it's it's really been a remarkable feat. I will say, you know, the first semester they were able to enroll was January for our Futures for Frontline program. And we had over 15,000 learners um, in uh, classes uh, this past semester. Um, and we were able just this semester to launch ReConnect. So, um, it's been an exciting time, but I think, you know, again, looking at the prior responses to the questions, tuition free is one thing. Transportation, you know, child care, broadband access, accessibility, you know, this is all we, especially with this new opportunity coming at us with the, re the American Rescue Plan, that, you know, we need to really think holistically, not only about how we get folks to school. And again, we hit on this, uh, those certificates and those high demand uh, career areas, our business community needs people to fulfill those roles so they can remain competitive in today's economy. So, um, you know, I just really look forward to where we're going to go from here. You know, we're going to, we're looking at a couple of things. I don't know if you want me to jump ahead or not, Matt, but I'm going to say looking ahead, we're looking at two things. One is we want to continue and build out, you um, uh, success grants and uh, helping and looking and working with the institutions to provide um, institutional change uh, to help uh, support persistence and completion for these students. So in a partnership, uh, we don't have a SHEO here in Michigan. It's decentralized system, but that's one thing that's focused. Getting folks to apply in, in school is one thing. Getting them to complete is another. And then we also want to look at uh, those COVID classes. Um, those COVID class uh, high school folks that have been impacted, how do we ensure that they have a path um, into college, whether that's four or two year programs, um, as well as the connect back those that those adult learners that have a few credits towards their degree but have yet to finish we want to again provide a pathway there so that's kind of where we're looking forward to. Now you're muted Matt. Yeah, I should have known better. Thank you for that perspective and again high volume of interest and participation, much like we heard. Um, from, the, from the other two panelists. Um, let's do, let's switch to the investment opportunity here with the, the stimulus resources and talk a little bit more about specific opportunities to use those funds to um, scale and evolve these, these programs. Uh, and then in a minute, I'll come back to sustainability because I know that's already been a question that's been posed in the, in the chat. But um, again, 40, $40 billion uh, flowing directly to post-secondary institutions. So even whether states have SHEOs or not, 
the money isn't actually sitting with the state, it's going directly to the institutions this time. Um, what uh, advice do each of you have and, and how are you thinking about yourselves leveraging the, these funds, these American Rescue Plan funds to continue to scale program, programs like the ones that you've already launched? Um, and if you have any advice for those who haven't done that yet or looking for ways to get started with that using these these this allotment of resources um, love to hear that as well if i could start with what we did this summer um, we know that greg and i know that in community college many of our students can't afford their course materials it's it's a fact i think statistically 65 percent of students just in college don't purchase one or more books but we know in community college at any one time more than a quarter of our students can't afford them because of other priorities as Carrie and Greg talked about. So we asked if we could use our CARES Act uh, institutional, we and got the okay to purchase our digital materials for the fall and spring. We did a $5 million contract with Cengage Unlimited to provide that the digital materials for about 40% of our student body. Um, we saw a 2% improvement in pass rates as a result of that meaning students had the materials they had what they needed in and that's compared to other years pre covid so if if we hadn't had the challenges of all the other things that we think that would be quite higher than that and of course our students were so thankful to have access so as a result we've received the clearance from usdoe to, um, it's been my goal for three years now to get to inclusive tuition. We, we now have our board approval to do what we call Ivy Plus, where we will include that those course materials. It'll be a digital first strategy, though we will use rentals and others through Barnes and Noble, our provider. It'll be a $25 million investment. We're going to use our SIRSA and, and ARP funds to, uh, to do, we've been approved for this year, we hope to be approved for next year to do the same as we transition into that inclusive tuition model. So this year we will actually hold tuition and all of our students will get their course materials for free. Uh, if they want a hard copy, it's like a $20 workbook, right? So, I mean, it is a, it's a wonderful thing. We're excited. We, literally it's going public as we speak. Uh, we've been we have been letting our students know uh, this week, but we just approved it last week with the board. It's a big deal. It transforms the way we deliver college. And my belief is that for community college students, for all college students, it should be. But for community college students, it's critical that we take barriers. And the number one barrier is having your course materials. It does you no good to be able to have a scholarship for that class if you can't afford the books uh, to be able to do that work. So that's an area where we were so pleased we could do Cengage Unlimited this past year to see how it works and now build on it to go inclusive with Ivy Plus into this next year. So Matt, next year I'll let you know how it went. Excellent. Well, love the creative approach and um, really glad to hear that um, it was approved and there were no kind of roadblocks put in place at the federal level because oftentimes I, we find that folks are concerned things aren't may not be allowable and it doesn't it's not written into the guidance that you can do x y and z but oftentimes you just yeah. need to put the proposal forward and the ideas forward. And especially right now we see a lot of flexibility in it, the, it, the i think funds. the um having done send the send gauge unlimited this past year and showing the results demonstrating it working helps you go the next step. But we, we've had very good, very pleased and appreciative of USDOE and their work with us on this. So we, we hope to, to demonstrate the benefits. Excellent. Um, Greg, Carrie, kind of creative use of these, this massive infusion of resources. Yeah, I'll just share a couple of things and, you know, varying levels of creativity, but I, again, keep thinking about the access elements and what's been created. And uh, and as many have already mentioned, you know, this kind of being in a, a once in a generation kind of opportunity. And for, for so long, we know that we've been working on expanding our online uh, access for students. You know, one of the things as we think about life getting in the way 
And, uh, you know, I, particularly again for our community college students who are doing so much and display so much courage, but oftentimes something will happen that gets in the way of their success. In fact, when you think about a lot of our students who stop out, it's not because of a lack of achievement academically. Uh, many of them have well over 3.0s and we call them and ask them why they stopped and they say, well, I had this life challenge in my family or, you know, I, I was running out of resources or, or something happened. And so I consider it to be a great investment for what uh, everyone has a different term for, it, but our flex classes or we call it streaming and learning or SNL. You know, we think about that student who may traditionally want to do their classes face to face, but says, you know, I have to go to. Uh, another state to take care of a family member or another country to take care of our family member. And that would mean they'd have to stop. But now with the investments that we've made in over 100 courses with our streaming and learning platforms, that student doesn't have to stop. As long as that student can have access to digital technology, whether they were traditionally face-to-face -face in that class, now they can go to Columbia, take care of their ailing parent and still take care of their family and still take care of their academic course load. That's critical. And those kinds of access opportunities, again, so that the student doesn't have to take two buses to get to us is really important. Adding 28 new online degree programs is something that we've also done as well, uh, knowing that that kind of flexibility can make a significant difference. When we think about some of the things that we've learned during this time frame. Uh, the investment in online advising has been absolutely incredible, one of which we know that we can see persisting for the long haul. Our advisors have had more contact with students during the last 15 months than we have in our recorded history around this work. And so we know students are leveraging those opportunities, not having to come in and wait online, not having to take, again, a commute to go and meet with an advisor, but now having full accessibility online has been really powerful. And then one of the things that we are uh, leaning into embarking on now, putting in play, and it's a bit of a feeder off of the work I described earlier, our Broward Up work. As I mentioned, we have uh, uh, about 19 partners that we work with in the hearts of our Broward Up communities. And one of the things we want to leverage these resources for, particularly those who have, for those who've been displaced by COVID, is the opportunity for those partners to serve, who are again, trusted partners in the community, to serve as placement agents. What would it be like if our partners knew that they would get an incentive, a financial incentive that we can leverage from CARES to place our students, our graduates, into jobs in those communities or beyond. And to think that now it's not the employees at Broward College only taking the lead on this, but now we have partners with the same mission of economic mobility to serve those who need us most and knowing that now that they have that high return credential that we can't emphasize enough, we can have those partners serve as placement agents for those same uh, students and future employees. And so, um, continuing to think about ways to bring the community into this effort. I'll actually share one other point, and I hope I'm not going over time here, but just one other point. You know, one of the things that we did was we decided in Broward County, with Broward College in Broward County, is that we have 31 cities. We were going, we decided to look at every single city to understand enrollment by city and enrollment declines by city. And we've had wonderful partnerships with our cities and we're looking at expanding those because now it starts to, these cities have to ask themselves with not only uh, enrollment being down, but it's also indicative of their employment rates going, unemployment rates, excuse me, going up during this time frame. that same corollary that we know exists. So now it's about embarking on shared ownership of enrollment, particularly of those most challenged in their, in their communities. We're being bold and sharing their numbers they're being bold in listening and hearing, and then engaging in what kind of shared responsibility can we take for, at the end of the day, upward mobility of their residents. Every political leader wants it, every city manager wants it, and certainly it's something that we want here at Broward College. You started, Greg, by saying you're not sure you get to the innovative part, but I can tell you that all was very innovative. Uh, that shared ownership and building those partnerships and creating incentives for placement um, pretty powerful stuff, um, dollars aside. I mean, that's really strategic, particularly when you hear about places that have done all the work to stand up these programs, even get adults to go into these programs and earn the credentials. And sometimes it's that lack of advising or social capital or social networks that lead to the 
getting the jobs. Um, that's powerful stuff. So, so really appreciate that. Um, let me shift to a question that's come in um, over the Q&A and encourage uh, viewers to add others if they want um, in the next few minutes here. But early on, as I think folks were hearing you talk about some of these um, new, bold, innovative programs funded by these, these federal uh, stimulus dollars, the question about sustainability was posed which I know is often on everyone's minds when you have this infusion of resources that you know won't, won't last. How do you um, stand up and build new, new strategies that you can then sustain when the federal resources uh, dry up? Um, I know it's been on your minds. Who wants to go first in, in thinking of telling us how you've been thinking about that? I'm happy to jump in, Matt, on this one. Um, so, so one of the things I think, so, you know, I think it's a, really a twofold question, right? You have the funding itself and it running out, and then you have the timing to spend it, right? And so one of the things that we're, we're looking very closely at is uh, the actual loss revenue component. And so what, as, as I hope your audience knows, and I'll just say it just their level set, is that uh, the lost revenue components, if you identify the lost revenue, the funding that we receive under HERF can be used to recapture that lost revenue. A, kid, a critical component of that is that lost revenue, those lost revenue dollars that you can capture from HERF, those dollars have complete flexibility, right? So you lose $1 of revenue, you recover that $1 from HERF, that $1 is not subject to the confines um, of the two columns that we've discussed, right? You can now spend that dollar on anything. And so really understanding that helps, it's helped us think about creating longevity with those dollars that again are not subject um, to the HERF qualifiers. So then we started to look at also, what are some of those things that we could invest in that have a important upfront capital infusion required to move forward. And then you can start to see the tail, if you will, on the front end. So um, I would suggest like this NF the SNL work um, that I described earlier falls into that category, which requires a significant capital infusion upfront, um, which we will spend clearly in the time frame. And then we've also looked at, and you have to do this before you make the upfront investment, is what is the ongoing maintenance going to be for those resources? So we felt comfortable that with enough capital investment upfront, which uh, the HERF allows us to do, then we can um, build the, uh, the uh, long-term costs into our traditional operating expenditures. So we've tried to think about, and I'll add one other piece, and that's the, simply this, the short-term needs that we have. And so that wasn't the heart of the question, but that's the, that, these are the three ways we've thought about it. What can we capture on lost revenue? What are the immediate short-term needs? And what are the big things that with the capital infusion up front of a significant amount, um, we make that investment and then can trail off and build into operating expenses. And I think one thing I know many and others have talked about this too is uh, employees. We have decided not to do anything that requires us to uh, to use the dollars to support employees. Uh, and when I say employees, new employees, right? Um, those ongoing uh, uh, costs I think would be difficult for us to swallow. Maybe. We can find an exception here and there, but uh, on the whole, um, that would seem to be a recurring course that be a cost that would be difficult uh, to maintain over time outside of those resources. Excellent, thank you. Great, great ideas, great strategies. Sue? Yeah, I'll, I think I answered in the, the note, the uh, question uh, on the next level jobs piece, but on the other, on the inclusive tuition, um, we had already planned on going towards inclusive tuition. We knew, our number said we would be adding about $19 a credit hour. And we have been negotiating and negotiating to get those, those dollars down. So we're able to, with these federal dollars, able to hopefully two years uh, do it for free. But that will give us a two-year track record on the amount of dollars saved. Our commission for higher education, our CHEO, is watching very carefully, very supportive of what we're trying to do and we'll have the results. So return on investment, better believe we're gonna look at those pass rates and the completion rates and, and placement, et cetera. So I think uh, it gives us time to, to look for even other options, but we're very prepared to continue our approach going forward. Thank you, Sue. And you, and you hit on another question that I know I've had about return ROI and return on investment, um, which is, a uh, you know, the other side of the coin of sustainability is, is how to 
how do you show return on investment of these dollars to continue to get, let's say, your legislatures over time to to want to fund the continuation of these programs? Uh, really important, especially with such a huge amount of money coming in quickly. So I'm glad you raised that. We've we've now got the attention of our state house and our what's called management performance hub, where we can we get annually the data on our students and their performance. So we know over the last three years we went from 38% of our graduates when you're out earning above median wage to now 54% of our graduates when you're out earning above median wage. Those kind of numbers talk, that is true. We know now that we are changing the lives into prosperity, so many more Hoosiers. I think those are the kind of partnerships we need with our state houses and our federal government as well, whether it's the IRS data or others, we should be able to see the outcomes of our students when they complete. And um, very pleased, it's been a slog to get to the point of getting that data. But now that we have it, we can see it by program, we can see it by campus. We, you know, of course you can't see small sample sizes, but you can see the differences that are being made. And I think ROI needs to be a part of it, but that means sometimes our partners need to partner with us to help us get that data that we within our own institution cannot capture. Well put. Thank you for reminding us of the data need. Uh, in some cases, I hear folks investing these dollars in building that data infrastructure, uh, at least when they have it at the system and state level. Carrie, thoughts on uh, either sustainability or ROI or both? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to follow suit here and say, you know, we are, as we've launched these programs in the last 10 months, um, that we are on the onsite, onset of that, right? You know, we want to, at the end of the day, be able to follow the data and nothing succeeds like success, um, as they say, especially when you do have to operate in a political environment to get those dollars allocated um, to support your programs on an ongoing basis. Like for us, yes, Futures for Frontliners, you know, purpose those um, CARES Act dollars, but reconnect our general fund dollars. Um, so we are very hopeful that we'll be able to build that up and um, show exactly those wage increases and meeting those demands from our business community to help sell this. I think the other thing that I point I would point out that when we launched Futures for Frontliners, just early on, we had Henry Ford College uh, struck a deal with Eastern Michigan University, and any graduate, a Future for Frontliner graduate that graduates from Henry Ford, Eastern Michigan says we will provide you a path, a tuition free path for a four year degree. And then we had other four-year institutions step up to make similar partnerships with their community colleges. So um, that's something, that's just partnership, innovative thinking. And I think the other thing about the student body or the learners that are applying for these programs, a lot of them are getting you know, grants to completely support and it's not taking any state resources to um, get them to a tuition free. So between the Pell Grant um, and other availability so us just talking about this opportunity, um, you know, what's the saying all with rising waters lifts all boats. Um, I think that we're really seeing this throughout our programs and getting more folks interested about going back to school. So it's good stuff. That is good stuff. Really great to hear the four-year institutions yeah. stepping up on those partnerships. Um, the, pow that, the power of that can't be understated, uh, overstated, I think. And you can see that happening at regional levels around the country where they're partnering to build the pipeline into good jobs, especially the jobs that do require more than a AA uh, degree. So I'm glad you raised that, Carrie. Um, so another question that's come in uh, here is about whether you've um, seen or in any case you're using any of these funds uh, to forgive excessive student loan debt. Um, and allow for those learners uh, to sort of make themselves whole. I'm not. I'm not sure we've seen that at scale. Uh, perhaps in small ways, and I'm not even 100% sure about the allowable use of those funds. But is that something any of you have pursued with the, with the, any of these dollars so far? I will. I will tell you my understanding is that is an allowable use, uh, and we have set aside some of the uh, funds to do that. 
uh, and we haven't deployed it yet, but we are look that is absolutely something that we are intent on doing. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things is that we continue to think about the guidance, you know, we have to continue to remember um, that the guidance really didn't get flushed out until maybe about a month or so ago. Right. And uh, and, and even still, um, there are a lot of questions as it relates to it. And the department, by the way, I must say, has been incredibly helpful at taking questions, at speaking publicly about it. But we're all so dynamic in terms of who we serve, how we serve, and the needs of our students. And so uh, there are a lot of uh, still many considerations being had. But, but this one seems to have been cleared up pretty well that we can use those resources to support, um, to offset student debt. And Carrie, you probably know about Wayne State had mm -hmm. a program that forgave student debt. We actually copied it a couple of years ago. We called it Fresh Start, where this is before COVID, that we would forgive up to $600. And we would do it over, well, ultimately all of it, but we would do it over a period of the three, three terms that they had to be successful. The interesting thing, and, and we still are kind of scratching our heads because we had not even a few hundred students take advantage of it. It was, uh, and I, I think there's more there. Uh, our community college debt is not the large portion of debt that most students face. It is four year uh, debt, uh, private school debt, et cetera. So, uh, but I, I think Matt, we haven't figured out how to best communicate that with those who would be able to take advantage. So I'll look to Greg to figure that out for me. Yeah. And when he when he figures it out, well, I'll look forward to being a quick adopter of that approach. But I think it's important. Um, but how you do it, it's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Well, and you you referenced Sue <laughs> earlier, I think communications and outreach. You 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 said it really quickly, but I want to come back to that for a second because I think you said something you used the phrase automatic marketing if i remember correctly like there was something that you automatically reached out to adults and told them they have the opportunity to do this i know this is a big part of all the strategies uh -huh. in uh, approaching adult learners even if you have if you can offer the free the free courses and the free programs and credentials you have to reach them first and convince you know get to them and convince them that this is um something they can do and that will work for them can you say a little bit more about how you've approached that and what you meant by that, if I got that phrase well, right. On well, I don't know if those were my words, but but okay. what we've done in general is if, if we have the contact information, we'll reach out to them directly, email, text, other letters, et cetera, and then have a landing page, an RFI or request for information so that we know they're interested. Where we'd really like to get, as I talked about with Department of Workforce Development, we'd really like to reach out to them when they're in need, when we know something has happened and we may not be the ones that they would naturally think about, but in the case of Department of Workforce Development or in the K-12 space, in the case of the high school, right, with our dual credit or soon to graduate, those seniors who have no plan kind of students, to have that, uh, that other organization that they are working with reach out on your behalf and encourage them to uh, or even to have a, um, a data sharing agreement that meets FERPA requirements that allows us, I always say we're a state agency too. <laughs> so can't we share information because oftentimes it is getting that clean list to know who they are and where they are that is one of the bigger challenges. And I think um, we've traditionally waited for students to come to us and now we really do need during these times and beyond, especially the populations that Greg and I want to serve and carry as well, we want to serve those underrepresented, those who have not enjoyed the American dream. How do we get to those individuals and ensure that they know we, you know, when we send out something that says free tuition on it, some of them think it's a joke. They're like, oh, that's just another, you know, somebody's making that up. Um, so we have to sometimes convince them that no, really, you can do this for free, it is covered. So making sure that we have that direct line to the individual is important. And I wish I could say that we figured it all out, we're getting better and our partnerships are getting better. 
And as Greg knows, when we can use our community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to help educate and inform and invite, uh, that helps tremendously as well. But it really does take a village to come around and support these students to be successful. Well said, and I think reminding us of the equity imperative here is really important. I wanna maybe close with a question on that. Um, it's come up through each of your um, comments and discussions, but any additional thoughts about how to ensure that these resources um, get um, directed and used in ways that truly reach and help um, those um, most underserved communities who have the most to gain from coming back and getting a credential of value, but oftentimes are the hardest to reach. I mean, we've heard a lot of this in Greg in your, in your strategy of building the partnerships and going to them. But if you think about these federal resources, um, any kind of thoughts about how to ensure that they get um, the maxim maximally accessible and impactful for those populations? I'm gonna jump in and lead with some stats that we've seen from our, our applicants. Um, so, and, and keep in mind, as we know, uh, the folks that have been most disproportionately impacted by COVID have been women and communities of color. And we've seen um, about just under 70% of our applicants are female. And we've also seen um, about 42% um, of our applicants are a person of color. Um, so just by offering this tuition free, that's who we are seeing um, apply for these programs. And I, and I, again, this isn't specifically addressing your question, but I, I always go back to the human part of this. And this is from Ms. Shabaka Bailey. She says, and I quote, I had thought about going to Lansing Community College to get my associate degree but I couldn't afford to pay the cost of tuition and still support my kids at the same time. Michigan Reconnect is a great opportunity for me to pursue my dream now. And again, I think that it's that childcare, it's all these, these things outside of tuition, we gotta look at these, this federal opportunity of how we provide these wraparound services to support these folks uh, to completion and get that job at the end of it. Thank you, Carrie. Well said, and the, the resources can and should be used that way. We've already heard good examples. Greg? And, and never, yeah. never underestimate the, uh, the value of our community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to be right with us. Yes, the federal dollars help, but their partnership can, mean, can help us make bigger progress. We call it bridges of hope, creating those bridges of hope that the federal dollars are good, but the partnership is even better. And I'll say finally, just to close, um, you know, continuing to invest in, in, in belonging. Um, you know, this is such a difficult time for so many people who have had difficult times their whole lives and their parents have had difficult times their whole lives. And as we think about our capacity to enhance those lives, all the things that we said, I think are on point and there's more to be said, but also enhancing belonging once they actually engage us is really critical. And I think those dollars can support that as well. Terrific. Thank you, Greg. Um, so thanks to all three of you for um, your leadership and providing us um, great examples of, of work you've already done and places you wanna go next and how we can all think creatively about this, um, this resource opportunity that's in front of higher education. For the viewers, thanks for um, being attentive for the past hour. Um, we hope we answered most of the questions that were posted. ESG will be circulating a recap and a recording of the webinar. So a written recap and also a recording. We'll try to embed in that recap links to examples of the programs that you've heard discussed. Um, so you can dig deeper if you wish. Uh, again, many thanks to uh, ACCT and SHEO, our national partners in making this opportunity available to so many people. We look forward to creating more spaces for these important conversations as this work goes on. Um, we have much more to do together, but really inspiring examples. And thank you again to the presenters. And I hope everyone else has a great rest of their afternoon. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Take care, everybody.